looking to be awesome. Thank you so much. So, um, Jeanette, welcome to our Mega Agent Monday Mastermind. Uh, we are so excited, as you know, and we talked about uh, Naples and Marco Island are luxury markets. And, um, you know, there are many opportunities, yet luxury is a big one of them. And you have done uh, an impeccable job with luxury, written courses, um, our leader in the luxury space. So we are so glad to have you. I've got questions for you, yet I'm Great. sure um, the agents that are here um, are also going to have some questions. Yeah, before we start, um, tell us a little bit about your journey in real estate, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, I was one of those dreaded part-time agents at the beginning of my career, and mainly it was because I was, I was about to get married. I had... We were had just bought a, a home. Um, my daughter was 16, getting ready to go to college. You know, I just had kind of a full plate. So I was just one of those part-time people. Oh, I'll do real estate on the side and thinking like I was going to be able to do a good job being a part-timer. And then, um, we, you know, we had a tragedy with our family. Um, my fiance was killed in a car accident a month before our wedding. I was left with this house I couldn't afford because I thought there'd be two incomes. Mm -hmm. I was left with a 16 year old who really was very close to him. So it was a very difficult financially and emotionally. And um, the house we had bought had been gutted. So we actually didn't even have mm -hmm. like a place to live <laughs> because it was in pieces, literally in pieces. And workers were showing up the next day with their hands out for their paychecks and you know, orders were coming in. I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And the only thing that I could think of is, well, number one, I have to start working. Um, but also I need to start selling homes that are way more expensive than I had been selling. Now, granted, this was 23 years ago. So um, my average price point was $99,000, which sounds really bad but 23 years ago I think you know I don't know what that would equate to today but it certainly wasn't luxury and I just did the math and I thought oh my gosh well I could work forever and get out of debt because I within three weeks I was in $140,000 in debt mm. because I had to pay contractors I used those credit card checks I don't know if they still do those oh. they have checks Oh in credit, you know, in your credit card bill. And I use those to pay for my home to be finished. Um, so which, it was just the interest rate on those is spectacular. Uh, well, at that time, you could do like transfer for zero percent for 90 days. Mm -hmm. And then I would have to transfer again. I mean, it was just a like a military precision that I just moved this money around. Um, but at the end of the day, I needed to make money. So um, I did the math and I'm like, well, uh, I need to sell $500,000 homes, which is like a, a $2 million house today. And I didn't know how to do that. I didn't have any clients. I didn't grow up with any wealth. I didn't belong to a country club. I had none of those things. Um, so I just always come from the perspective that anybody can sell luxury properties if that's their desire. Um, there are a lot of things that go into making that happen. Um, and one of the most important things is you don't have to, what like what I did, jump from 99,000 to 500. I mean, hopefully no one's in that type of a situation. I really do believe more in a stair-step method of just saying, and you know, whatever your average price point is, um, uh, you know, I'm going to raise my average price point 40% next year. And knowing that if you're even in a slightly appreciating market, that 40% is not all on your back. You know, you have appreciation where you're naturally going to sell more expensive properties because everything's more expensive. And then the rest you do have to carry on your back. And there's strategies that we can talk about that kind of go into identifying where those should be. But you don't have to go from zero to 80, you know, in one year. Um, that requires really a lot of luck. And there's a lot of instability that, that can come with that. Mm -hmm. I, I think a more solid business model is to create a plan that you want to sell at X price point. Or maybe there's even a certain neighborhood or area that you 
have been aspiring to get to and work your way backwards. Like, what do I need to do to sell there or to sell at this price and put together something very strategic that you stick to and course correct from when things go off track and have a three, four, five year plan, um, you know, to quadruple uh, your, your price point. I think that's very doable. And I've coached many, many, many people to do that. And, and through the strategies we've used, they've been able to do it in three years or two years, uh, several of them. It doesn't have to be a long, a long process. It's a lot of it's up to you. Mm -hmm. Jeanette, tell us about your um, sales volume over time. So that was the beginning of the game. There's, you know, the life moment of, oh goodness, I've got to do something. Um, how did that focus compound over the next 20 or so years? What does it look like? Well, for uh, 15 years, maybe 12, I was just a solo agent and I always had an assistant. In the beginning, I just had University of Texas interns because I couldn't afford anything. But it, in every every semester, it would be a different person. So you know what that's like. But I think it's important that you you just do what you can and where you are where you are at at the moment. So at that time, if I sold four million dollars in real estate, I thought that was good. I mean, I think my first year it was a million dollars of $99,000 homes. So that wasn't a ton of transactions. Again, I was, I was part-time, but as the, my big why, which was, I got to get out of debt and I got to get my daughter into college and, and pay for that. Um, then very quickly, I was at 5 million and then doubled that to 10 and then 30 and then 60. And, and for many years as a solo agent, I was around 50 to 60 million um, you know, 10 ish or so years ago, which would be the equivalent. That was like the top one quarter of 1% of the agents in our city. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's another point to, to consider when you hear people talking about luxury, you must know that luxury is different in every market. The technical definition of luxury is three times your your area's average. So in Austin, Texas, our average is 485,000 for our, our MLS system. So roughly around a million three, million three fifty would be considered luxury. Now I know KW luxury has different criteria, but it's just illogical to think that luxury is the same in Manhattan as it is in Des Moines, Iowa, right? So, so this seven or eight hundred thousand, whatever the, the cutoff is now, I I don't really use that as a marker. Mm -hmm. I think if you're listening, you look at your area and also look at what you're doing and make the determination. I want to be triple this in X number of years. And then you're going to work your way back. How what percentage increase do I need to focus on each six months, even? in order to get where, I, where it is that I really wanna be. So it's a very specific conversation for each person. Mm -hmm. But Love our that. last few years, you know, when I decided to bring on agents, um, that was just, you know, I don't know what I was doing. I, I, you know, I blessed them for even considering working with me because I really was like struggling to figure it out. Um, a few years ago, four or five years ago, I joined, Chris Suarez expansion team experience, which later has uh, merged with Ben Kinney's to form place. And, and that's really what kind of got me to the next, I, you know, I was kind of hitting a ceiling. Um, before that I was maybe, I seem to always be missing Gary Keller's top 100 by like a deal. And then the next year he would raise it. And I'm like, ah, you know, and then I'd still <laughs> miss it by a deal. I was like, so frustrated. Um, but, but eventually I got into that, but that was like my, that was like what I wanted. And I think at that point we were probably at 120 million, um, you know, pretty consistently. And then after I joined with, um, Chris and then ex experience became place, then we're usually around 200 to 250 million. The important thing about that, though, and this may be on some of your radars down the road, is that I'm only about 18% of that number. 
Mm -hmm. As before, I was 100%. If I went on a vacation, part of the cost of the vacation was that I would not be making any money. You know, so there was that expense, right? Um, that, you know, that can be significant. And then there's the ramp up to get back. So a month vacation might cost me seven weeks mm -hmm. in, in total. Um, but now with the team, you know, we have different leverage. And and that's what I'm really most proud of is, is that we've, you know, created a business model where there are agents that we can help, help support. And they're doing something for me too. That's why I'm able to, come up to to this other home um and not be working you know every minute of the, while I'm here yeah I might work 10 not. hours a week just you know to keep things going and meetings like this and and they're working and we're still doing you know significant amount of production each each year yeah mm -hmm. a life worth living a business worth owning all of those things there's all a couple things. A couple of points that I, I just love being in conversation with people who think really big. And I love how you said, if I take a one month vacation, did anybody else catch that? Some of you are like a one month, if I could just get the one week in here. Okay. That's why we have these conversations to stretch us and our thinking um, 250 million. And I'm pretty sure in your bio, Jeanette, you've sold over a billion dollars in real estate sales. Right. That is astounding. So um, anyway, it's amazing. I'd love to get back to when you talked about the breaking into luxury. Like when you first started, I realized 99,000, my first closing was 78,000. I was right there with you. <laughs> and, um, and I remember my maps coach said, you have a lot of kids and what are you doing with these $78,000, $90,000 people? And she said something to me that was really hard to wrap my mind around. And it was, um, in order to say yes to the half a million and the million, you're going to have to say no to the $70,000 and the $90,000. And my first thought was, I can't do that. I've got to pay the bills. And yet once I started to understand what that meant, everything changed. So did you have any moments where you had to say no to things to say yes to getting into luxury? Yes. I, and I always talk about that. And even now what you say no to opens up your time for what's really important. And that's why I believe it really starts internally to get the clarity that, that it is that what it is you're really going after. Um, a lot of times, well, we just can't do it all, right? It doesn't matter what our family looks like or how much help we have, if we have a supportive spouse or no spouse or three kids, or there just is just not enough time to get to everything. So I, you know, once a year, I, I, I do a little white space break where I go away to this place in Austin. Um, it's like a health and wellness retreat, but I don't bring anything with me, but a notepad and a, a pen. I don't bring my phone. And that's my white space time where I really just think about, you know, what it is that I need. And I think it's really important when you're looking at your business and you're determining, I want this in three or five years or 10 or 15 years to, you know, maybe you do want those month, month long vacations and um, what has to happen. But you're working so hard towards that and in the process saying no to lots of different things that you really need to be extremely clear what it is that you're going after. So Jeanette, um, if you writing that plan that you talked about, the three to five year plan, um, let's get nuts and bolts tactical. What would you put specifically on that plan so that they, you know, clarity is power. What, what would you put on there? Well, I knew that I wanted to get out of day-to-day -day production. And so uh, it started for me with the math of what do I, is that the little one that had diarrhea? Um, no, that's a, that's a big one. That's handing me a field trip permission slip. I mean, you guys can't make this stuff up. He's home, I know. He's like, he's home <laughs> sick from school and he I wants to it. fill out I paper. Sweet. <laughs> never ends. Um, yeah, so for me, it started with math because I had a big financial hole, right? And it it really just was, I need to sell 
$500,000 houses. Where are those $500,000 houses? Okay. So, so it went from a number to a geography. And if okay. you're like me, like our market in Austin, there's lots of places that had $500,000 houses, right? So then I went into our MLS and I said, 450 to 550,000. I went back like a couple of years and I just tracked what areas had the most velocity of those sales. And then when I narrowed down those areas, I said to myself, do I know a singular person in this area? Do I have I had a sale? Have I represented a buyer in this area? Or is it adjacent to another area where I do have good traction? Or does that area feed into an elementary school that 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 I've worked in another area that feeds into that elementary school like is there any common thread at all and that helped me narrow down I think at that time to two or three areas and and I went ahead and invested in marketing to all of them and being really purposeful like part of that plan would be okay how am I going to hit these three neighborhoods and I decided um I needed to toot my own horn, which I think a lot of people are uncomfortable doing, particularly women, actually. The science shows women are uncomfortable talking about themselves, about their accomplishments. So I had to decide how was I going to do that and how was I going to get in front of these people? And for me, open houses were very lucrative for me. I was good at thinking on my feet. Um I would would I I came prepared, you know, for that house. Um, they weren't all my listings, of course, because this is when I I kind of didn't have a great book of business yet. But I would go to another agent in that area. I would show them. I'm going to send you a report the day of. I'd show them my template of a report. I'm going to send you this report the day of. I'm going to put out 20 open house signs. I, I just kind of had a little bio of these are the things that I, this is what I do. And these are the things I'm going to do for you. And it, pretty quickly, I had five or six agents who always called me for mm -hmm. open houses. So I had more open houses that I could deal with. And I came prepared. Again, if you're talking about areas that maybe you're not that experienced in, maybe you haven't had a sale in, maybe they don't know your name or even your company. I mean, not everybody knows every brokerage. And then it was really a matter of making sure that when I was there, they were not disappointed. So I knew quarterly um, schedules, in, in, in other words, which quarter so was the highest sale, selling for that area, second quarter, fourth quarter, whatever. Of course, I knew appreciation rates. I knew every house that was on the market, even if I just walked in for 10 seconds to the neighboring comps, I could at least say enough in that open house where the buyer, the prospect knew I had been there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started doing things as kind of price points went up, I started doing things that made me memorable. Like, you know, it's hot as heck in, in Texas. So in the summer, I just bought a package at Tuesday morning, which is like the cheapest place you can buy linens. And I, I froze them in lavender water and I rolled them up tight. If you've ever been to a nice hotel and I, and I got this little platter that looked silver, but it was more like plastic. I mean, well, I didn't have any, any money. Right. So I rolled it up and when people would come walking in, I pull it out of the refrigerator. I freeze it the night before, let them kind of thaw the first few times I would pull them right out of the freezer and they never thawed during the open. So, you know, you learn every time you do something, but I pull them out of the refrigerator. I'd hand one with a thought, you know, little tong and they were like, Oh, wow. Thank you. This is amazing. Now that cost me like $12, but it stood out in their minds. And, and so those kind of little things you can do. So when you're do doing your call follow-up and people are like, what, who, you know, they went into 20 open houses that day. Like, oh, I was the one with the cold towel. Oh yeah, that was amazing. They remember you. In the winter, I would always um, have like a, you know, I, I pick up all my ideas from hotels apparently, but you know, they have a, a little box and it has all the different teas. Mm -hmm. And I just had a teapot on the, on the stove. I'm like, can I make you a hot tea while you're walking around? 
I mean, it was very inexpensive. Now, uh, you know, I might partner with the coffee, a, a local coffee house, and they'll have fancy teas. And, you know, we've done wine flights at open house. I mean, it just, it, you know, as the price point goes up, your ideas and your your flash needs to be a little bit, you know, elevated, but it is a matter of elevating the experience for the client because they have to remember you. There's a lot of agents. I don't know how many in your market. We have 16,000 licensed agents in the Austin Board of Realtors and 67% of them have been licensed for less than four years. Hmm. You should know that stat from your board because I get a lot of business using that stat. Um, because I let them know, you know, very few of those people have been through a shifted market. None of them have been through 9-11. That was 22 years ago, but I worked during 9-11. Um, none of us have been, uh, none of them have been through um, 28, 20, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010. And I just sell them on the fact that, that there's a benefit to having, work through a shifting market and how you advise buyers and sellers is different. And for the rest of my team who some are only licensed for two or three years, they just say our team we, mm -hmm. has worked through two shifted markets. You could say if you're, if anyone's new on here, our brokerage. I mean, I think also that's another, another point is if you're new, you're not on a team Get yourself a mentor and know that you it's going to have to be an equitable exchange for them too, because they're busy. So if that means, and I did this, if, if that means you've got to run across town to drop off flyers for, for someone, that might be what, I mean, I was like a gopher for two years. I did anything that any agent wanted because I needed their help. And, and then as that has grown, it became more of, I needed guidance and advice. So we would, you know, I would put sign open, you know, everybody hates putting open house signs out. So I thought, what is the thing that the agents hate doing the most? Putting out signs and putting out open house signs. So I hired this little um, high school kid that lived next door to us. And he went out and put out open house signs for people and, I would just hand him a map with marks on it, put them here. And I paid him, you know, he was happy to get $20. So, so, you know, you have to think um, if, if it's the easy button for other agents so that they can mentor you and help you with things like pricing, which I think is huge. I hope we have some time to talk about that. Um, what, whatever it is, or if it's the easy button for the client, because as you work your price points up, the other thing that you will notice is high net worth individuals at HNWIs are used to everyone around them making their lives easier and they pay for it, right? They pay for it, whether it's a maid or a dog walker or, you know, someone to do their ironing, they're, they're willing to pay for it. And remember, they're paying you too. So I have done all of those things. Um, I've, I mean, even to this day, I, I'll go clean a house if it needs to be cleaned. Um, I picked up dog poop in the yard and in a house before. Um, you know, I've watered plants while people have been out of town. Our, our motto is, is if it's not illegal, if it's not immoral, if it's not unethical, we will do it. And I tell them that. You know, my clients that, that work with me, that have worked with me for years and years, and I've reduced that number from 16,000 people I marketed to down to 104 households. So I, I personally only work with 104 households in any referral that an agent sends. If they say, I want you to work with them, I'll, I'll work with them. But my, my agents, they took the remainder of that 16,000 that I marketed to for all those years, and we get business out of that. Uh, we get a lot of business out of that. We still nurture that business the way we always have. And they, my agents, say the same thing. Yes, it, there's it, there's not a no. Unless it's illegal, immoral, immoral or unethical, it's a yes. Do it. So Do it. I just tell them, you say yes, and then you come back and we'll figure it out. We will figure out how to make it work. And sometimes we roll our eyes and sometimes we go, oh my gosh, you know, these requests. But But wealthy people are used to being surrounded by people who say yes. 
And they're also used to being surrounded by people who are very savvy. And so it just, if you're wanting to work your way into the very top of your luxury market, you may be dealing with C-level people. You may be dealing with CEOs. Certainly you're dealing with entrepreneurs. You're dealing with people that understand business. They're financially savvy statistically. Um, they are incredibly financially savvy and they get news every week from 11 different news sources. That That's a, a statistic from Forbes magazine. So you better brush up. I don't mean you need to be an economist. You don't need to be an accountant. You don't need to be a genius, but you at least need to be up to speed on current affairs so that you can feel comfortable when somebody throws something out, you don't look at them like a deer in headlights. You just, you have to be able to have a little bit of spiel, particularly in your listing presentations in those open houses. Everybody always asks, where do you think interest rates are going? And you need to have a more tangible answer than I don't, my crystal ball is broken. And yeah, they know that. I mean, they're not really thinking you have a crystal ball. So stop saying those things. But mm -hmm. but do say something that you've gotten from a credible source because you need to be the news channel. I mean, how many times have you listened to probably someone in your no local news that have said the market's up, the market's crashed, the market, and you're thinking, well, not really. I mean, you know, and they're making a, um, they're doing a report for probably a huge area. Like mm -hmm. a, when, when our reporters in Austin are talking about an area, they're actually talking about eight cities. Mm -hmm. Even in Austin, there's a bunch of micro markets. So you have to be the news channel. You have to be able to educate your buyers as to why this is a great time to, to purchase, even at the luxury price point, those same people that were standing in 40 foot deep of, of traffic trying to get in an open house and giving away all their leverage and overpaying. And they were willing to do that, but now they're not willing to put in an offer when they don't have to do that. You have to be good at showing them the interest rate. Sure. But let's look at the appreciation. If the area you're looking at is appreciating 10%, I don't know. You've got to you've got to know your numbers. But the the increase, the one percent increase in interest rate really doesn't impact that entire 10% appreciation, then they're just going to keep getting behind every year. Mm -hmm. Their house payment is still going to be too high. And you've got to be able to explain that to sellers too and to buyers so that they look at you for the news and they're not distracted by what this this broad scope perspective that are that they're hearing that is usually very wrong. How do you, so let's say you are, um, maybe you've done a luxury sale or two and yet you're looking to make that more of your full focus. Jeanette, what would you do or encourage people to become a student of luxury? Like how do they immerse themselves? What are the things like, I, I love that you talked about the different news sources and current stats, and you've got to have these lines. What else are there books that they can read, podcasts, um, people to interview? How can they become a student of luxury? I think all of those things, magazines. Um, I mean, anything that has to do with what a wealthy consumer might purchase. So when I started, we didn't have Google. <laughs> That's how long ago that was. I used to go to Borders Bookstore and I would literally grab the New York Times, Cigar Aficionado, something about wine. So, you know, I had this kind of preconceived notion, well, everybody that would buy a million dollar house, which at that time was like, I, I mean, that was like, I'd never even walked into a million dollar house, but I wanted to sell them. So like, what are these people, what's important to them? So I just grabbed every, everything. So not just about the market or financials, but about lifestyle. I started reading a lot about customer service. Um, there's a few great, um, there's a podcast called, I'm going to look it up so I give you the right name, but there's a podcast called the luxury. Yeah, here it is. The luxury Institute. It's not CLHMS certified luxury home market it's not it has nothing to do with that it's a, a man named Milton Petrovsky runs it and the luxury institute is and there's there's years and years of content I mean you can 
go back and look, but it's, it's just about a luxury product. So it, anyone who sells, you know, it's about branding, emotional intelligence for the luxury consumer. It is not a real estate podcast. It's anything with luxury. And to me, I think that you have to be broad based in education because people want to work with people that they like and that they think understands them. Oh, one more time, the name of the podcast. It's called Luxury Institute. Luxury Institute. And it's a blue, um, it's kind of a, I don't know if you can see this. You see, it's kind of like, I think Blurry. because I have you have the back of me on, let me unblur. Okay. It looks like this. Okay. That blue one, the Luxury Institute. But I mean, there's lots of other things that you can look at too. Um, uh, I like, um, oh gosh, there's, uh, I, I do get some things out of Inman. Um, I pull up the Christie's white pages. Um, there's also the, uh, is it the Frank Knight or the Knight Frank report? Let me see. Because they are international um nightfrank.com um they're an international they also cover commercial there's always a lot of financials in there um if you just focus on those few things the the christie's white paper comes out once a year but you can look at the old ones um i think it just gives you some talking points about the economy um you know, sometimes there's stuff in there just about planes and, you know, I don't know how many of your clients have planes, but, but, you know, I had a, a, a client that he used to coach that he was um, an aspiring pilot. He was taking lessons. And so he's like, I want to sell to everyone that's flying in and out of our private airport. So he decided to focus on that. Mm -hmm. And he indeed sells to a lot of those pilots now, and they refer big time people to him like major money. So I think it's a matter again of clarity, putting together a game plan. If there's something specific that you're like really into, then pick up some materials on that and then laying out really a business model. You know how we have like one, three, fives, mm -hmm. goals. do a one, three, five for raising your price point or for getting into a particular area or neighborhood. I mean, break it down into measurable, you know, a smart goal, specific, measurable, break those goals down so you can be tracking your progress. How am I doing on this? Because you know how it is before you know it, a year has gone by and you're still, you know, not, you haven't made, you've, you've been busy, but not, but you've just been transacting and you haven't been busy with your, with your business plan. And mm -hmm. and I do think luxury, you know, when you do get like that one deal or something, um, you need to squeeze all the juice out of that deal, right? You need to use that. That's when you're going to spend some money. Go ahead and do mailers. Uh, mailers are my greatest ROI after open houses. And I know they're expensive, but if they're targeted, if you know that you want to sell in this particular neighborhood, I mean, I've even gone in and broken down streets. When I was on a tight budget and I was looking at a neighborhood, I pulled out the streets that were the high traffic streets because I knew if I could get a sign there, That's everybody good. else would see it. Yes. How many of us have driven by the competitor's sign in this prime location? You're like, oh, that would be so good. I love yeah. it. Yeah, definitely. So I have a question. When you um, immerse yourself, you're reading these different things. Um, you know, when you think about a luxury um, consumer, if they're not your peers on social media, it's not like you can just start posting stuff on social media and you're going to attract the right people. How do you get into the world to convey this knowledge? I personally don't get a lot of value out of social media. So I never, we've never used, I mean, we do our basic stuff, but we don't think of it as it's going to really return 
any any major investment. Um, but again, I would go back to mailers and your conversations with your clients. I do believe that human beings naturally want to help other people. And you can't be afraid to go to your client and say, I've been trying to break into this neighborhood um, for the longest time. And, you know, can, will you help me? Will you let me know if you hear about anything? And generally people will help you. Um, but the, the other best thing is just to do open houses in those neighborhoods. I mean, that's where you really get in front of people. Um, you're going to have to get in 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 front of people or on the phone. I don't believe, um, you know, I know there's a few agents like Nikki Klein who has a big social media following. So she would disagree with, with me, but I don't believe that you're going to make a tremendous amount of headway, particularly if you're going after HNWIs who primarily aren't on Facebook, really, mm -hmm. um, that you're going to be able to do that in social media. I think it's face-to-face, you know, luxury is belly to belly. And if you're, if you can't get in open houses and if you can't, you don't have a sale that you can squeeze some juice out of and blanket everyone in that market, then you need to pick up some type of a hobby or a charitable organization. That's where wealthy people will spend their time. You know, they, they have more free time and they will go to the golf course. They will go play tennis um, I mean, I don't have time or, or particularly years ago, didn't have the money to go golf all Sunday, but I might volunteer to, you know, do something at a golf tournament, or I volunteered a whole heck of a lot at our um, um, humane society, because it was something I cared about. And there was a lot of women there also volunteering and women tend to be drivers when they're picking their agent. Of course, I volunteered a lot at school, but then, you know, for, for you moms, I know it's really hard with you moms and dads. I know it's really hard, but oh my gosh, um, the, the referral opportunities in schools is amazing. Mm -hmm. And there will be a point where your kids are out of school and you will lose that opportunity. And you'll wish it back. So I think it's perfectly fine. Um, I was always the mom at volleyball with my laptop open working. And I would make sure that, you know, my daughter knew I would make sure she was going to serve, that I was watching, you know, I try to pick and choose. But consequently, what happened is everyone around me knew, knew me as, as the mom realtor. Mm -hmm. They could see me doing things. They could hear me on the phone out in the hallway. So they knew I was working hard. So, so I know you mommies and daddies are overwhelmed, but use your children yep. <laughs> while well, you it. can. Well, while you have them. They need, they need to earn their keep. <laughs> Seriously. You tell the ones that's uh, handing me more work to do. Uh, Mark, I think you had a, your hand raised. Thank you, Amber. Hi, Jeanette. It's nice to see you again. Good to see uh, you, Mark. You either either you or somebody on your team had a listing on Overlook Pass, and it got thirteen thousand views on on online. Can you talk about that listing a little bit and, and share some insights? And then, is that home? I think that sold for about eight million dollars or somewhere in that range. Tell us a little bit about Austin Mark in, in last year. How that home compares today? You were kind of cutting out after you said the amount of money. You said, tell us a little bit about, can you repeat that? Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, it's breaking up a little, but were you asking about the marketing for that? Is that what you were saying? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So that was um, actually a listing that we had for a long time. And then um, I got it, uh, I used a PR company to um, do a write-up on it. And that's that's how we got all those views. So um, I've used this PR company before. Um, it was 
maybe a tiny bit. I mean, I don't, I don't know what expensive is to everyone, but I think it was maybe about a thousand dollars. Um, but place has a PR company now, so I don't pay for that anymore. But at that time, that's what I did. I, uh, we shot a specific video. Um, we used all the video that we, that was available to us, like aerial walkthrough, because it was large acreage and it was a large home. Um, but we got all that traction from a PR company. And that's not something I would do on every um, home. You know, it's probably needs to be at least $4 million and not moving. You know, like we're, we're, we're struggling like for something to get some activity and, and um, so it has to really qualify because it's, it's an expense that we don't usually take on. Our big expenses for marketing really are labor because I've got two um, full-time people and while we use all the technology that's available to us, um, and, I'm, and I'm sure everybody does, I find that the biggest impact is the old-fashioned telephone. And it just takes people to call. And so when we have a big listing like that, um, we just do dial for dollars. And it's me, my two full-time marketing people, and we call all of the agents that have represented a buyer or a seller in that kind of area in the past three years. So sometimes it could be 400 agents. And I don't mean call and leave a message. We call until we can have a conversation with them. And the, the sellers really like that because, um, you know, we I get a lot of information from those agents. Like if we finish all 400 calls and only five people say they have a buyer, that's coming in anytime in the near future, that's a great bit of data. But if 40 people say they have someone, that's a now we've got a different program that we're gonna be following. So um, that property, we did the calling. We hosted um, a, kind of a, a fairly big agent event there, but my sponsor, my, like my title people and my insurance guy paid for all the food. So that didn't cost us anything. And um, we just hammered out not just calls, but also we use slide dial. Does anybody know what slide dial is? We use slide dial to remind people, you know, of, hey, this event is coming up. Um, and we also text out invitations. I just find that no one in our market reads their email. Like everything automatically goes into a spam folder. And 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 we're the chief reminder officers, we're the CROs for that particular property. And we might hit them five different ways. And it just takes people to do that. And if you don't have a big staff, I mean, interns can do it if you can give them a script. Um, you know, you just, you know, maybe you partner with another agent who can, you know, help you do some of that kind of legwork. And then you return the favor when they're you know, help, help each other before you go out and hire people, help each other or split a person, you know, have two or three people go in and split a person, but don't let that be the reason why you don't start picking up the phone and calling agents. I tell you, that is my, my best data point when I'm doing um, pricing for some of these listings. All this stuff we talked about, you can do it at 110%, but when you get a listing, if you don't price it right and it doesn't sell, what's the point, right? So pricing is extremely important. And one of the things that we do when we're pricing a property is we will phone on all, all the agents who have a competitive active, all the agents who have listed a property that's pending, that's competitive. And then the sold section, the agent who represented the buyer and the listing agent. And we will call them and we'll ask them a series of questions and we put it into an Excel spreadsheet. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of MLSs have like a quick CMA where the properties kind of just go into it and, and they're kind of short, you know, they're, you know, ours are like, you know, yeah. eight and a half, they're small. Um, and I bring that with me to my listing appointment, but I download that data into an Excel 
That's and then in my Excel, I have all these additional columns. There's seven additional columns that are not part of the regular MLS. Ours is called a quick CMA in our MLS. Mm -hmm. And same. I tell the seller, um, is it the same with you? Mm -hmm. Do you have that? And I'm like, what is that? I tell my seller, I'm pretty sure you don't care if it was quick. You want it to be accurate, <laughs> right? I mean, they don't care if it took me 48 hours, right? To they, they want their dollars right. And so I show them the little bitty quick CMA. And then I literally print my Excel mm. on the biggest piece of paper possible. Because I love the wow factor of, un I mean, I'm literally like unfolding it. And my page is like huge compared to a little quick CMA that they may have seen with another agent. Mm. And right there, you're Done. different. And also I can't see because I'm old. And so <laughs> I need it on a big bit. So it actually accomplishes too. And a lot of my clients are, you know, seriously, like they, they can't read it. So, uh, but in those additional columns is the, a comment section. Mm. And that's where I list everything that the agent has said. And many times in a sale, we're finding out things that you can't see in the MLS that materially change the value of that property. And the fact that you took the time to make those calls, I mean, I like repeat it three times. So they really get it. And nobody else is doing that. It's so simple. It, it builds a lot of goodwill with other agents. You find out a whole lot about coming soon's that they may have. You find out if they had no traffic, if they had multiple offers. I mean, all of those things are so critically important in pricing because it, you know, pricing is a strategic question. It's not a value question. And that's what I tell the sellers, it's not about your house. It's about the market that their house is in. And you really have to educate them so that they are comfortable pricing where you want to price. Or at least if you don't win that battle, and sometimes I don't either, we price where they want to price it at. And then the feedback's coming in. I get written feedback I get written feedback from each agent and I just scan that puppy over and whatever it says. Now they have a little bit of a basis of, you know, I don't say like, remember I told you, but, but, you know, we reintroduce that Excel spreadsheet and we look at those numbers again. And it's just, you know, one seed planted in case the offer comes in a lot lower or they, or you don't win that battle for the listing number you're establishing that there is a strategy to working within the market. Doesn't mean your house is bad. It just means this is where the market is at. And this is where we need to be. If you're going to be a successful seller, if you're going to be an unrealistic seller, sometimes it is good to your point, you know, before Amber to say no, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's that, that saying, I don't know if you've ever heard it's best to be the firstborn, the second wife and the third realtor. <laughs> and, and that is so true in a market like this, where many sellers are still looking in the rear view mirror and every buyer is looking forward. Every buyer is on an auto feed from Zillow and Redfin and who knows that. And they're getting price reduction, price reduction, price reduction, price reduction. And you need to explain to your seller, this is what they're seeing. They don't see what your neighbor got 23 months ago. Like nobody cares about that anymore. Um, so pulling that information together for so you can, number one, price properly but have the data to back it up. You're not just saying it needs to be X. You've got the conversations with other agents. You have the quarterly velocity. Like right now, you know, we, we have a strong fourth quarter, but we don't have a, a really strong September. So mm -hmm. I'll tell people, wait, wait until October. This is why I can show historical charts back 10 years that show that November and December, we have a lot of closings, almost equal to what we have in March and April. Hmm. So it's not a bad time to list, but you have to show that. The The other last thing on, on pricing um, that I'll leave you with is I get more uh, traction out of getting a seller to see my way on pricing 
with price bands than anything else. Do you know what price bands are? Not a lot of people use price bands. Ranges. Yes. Yes. And I do it for every property and I just show them, you know, I put it in, uh, the way I do it is I put it in order from low to high on list price. And of course, the pendings and the closed are all mixed in there. It's the search is active, pendings closed. And so when you put it in order of list price, the, the statuses all get mixed in. You're going to have actives and sold. You know, they're all together. And so when you look to the right in the columns, what normally the sold data is, it's very easy to see if there's if those cells are filled in, that means the property sold. So it's simple to see where the movement is. And that really blows people's minds. Like they, they, when they see that in one price band, there was all solds and there's no competitors, then they're more interested in being there than the price band either above or below it. It's not always that the better price band is a lower price. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can show them. Um, and, and we just pull all that data Sometimes we do market analysis for a property three different ways. You know, if it's a unique property and there's a lot of acreage, we might look at acreage properties. If it's a high price point, we we're going to look at high price points all across Austin, Texas, because my buyers will look downtown and they'll look in Westlake and they'll look 30 minutes away. Mm -hmm. Right. They, they, they are attached to just one school. Mm -hmm. Right. They will look lots of places, particularly when they're relocating. So I might do a market analysis just from these are all the high price listings all throughout Austin, Texas. So I might have two or three market analysis for the property, plus the price man analysis, plus the quarterly velocity. And I put it into a, a hard binder, you know, like a unibinder. And mm -hmm. I put tabs for each section. Um, one of those is the big Excel. So when you open the book, that's where we have to like roll it open. And every single time they say, no one has shown us this in-depth information. So if you're starting in luxury or just going after a big property, I mean, really for any property, you know, to do the work really is our our calling, right? That's what we're, we're, we're called to do. And that's our fiduciary responsibility. And I think right now there's a lot of agents who they've never been through a shift. They have no idea. Um, they have it. They're not used to working hard because two years ago, you had to be an expert at dodging rain in a rainstorm if you weren't <laughs> close to fields, right? You know, and so they're like, what happened? Why is it not easy? And they don't know how to work hard. When I started in real estate, 9-11, it just happened. And you had to work hard and smart because it wasn't easy. And I, I feel like that was a really great blessing for me to not come into real estate at a time where it was so easy. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'll tell you one more thing. If you haven't, I had to dust off my copy of Shift, but the seller's portion of Shift in 2008, I literally memorized that chapter. And every, because every single person wanted these prices that no one was getting. And I would just go in and just like, doo -doo -doo -doo, just repeat the entire paragraphs of the seller shift section. So dust that one off. It, it's a good one. You know, uh -huh. and we're so blessed that we're at KW. I mean, honestly, we have people all the time that you know, they leave for a little bit and they come back or, you know, when Compass came to our market, they were writing huge checks. I mean, they made me an offer, which would have been the equivalent of $800,000 over three years. And I said no to that. Um, but I really believe that there's no magic bullet, any brokerage. Otherwise, every single person there would be knocking it out of the park. Mm -hmm. And no one anywhere else would be doing it. So that's illogical that a brokerage has the answer. Um, it, it really is, I believe, a collaboration of the people around you because you are never going to know everything. No. 
You're just never going to know it all. And you need to be in an environment and, and everyone said, I mean, you, it, an, a, another thing that I like to study are coaches like um, Urban Meyer, I mean, you know, Urban Meyer in Florida, like uh, people who lead teams, mm-hmm. whether they're, whether they're like corporate teams or a, a football team, like, you know, they're, they're like brutal in their competition, right. Mm-hmm. With one another and, and, collaborative and supportive they have to be or their team doesn't win and that's what I think the mindset is at at Keller Williams is everybody collaborates to the greater good and you know you can talk to a lot of brokerages and they're going to say a lot of things and there's super shiny objects all over the place but but building your own business and not somebody else's in an environment where the mindset is positive and supportive is you you can't put a price tag on on that. I think Kim Jones and I were just having that same conversation on Friday at a mastermind. Um, we have had a small local boutique. Uh, some agents have gone, and I was actually looking with team leaders this morning. Down forty percent, down sixty percent, down thirty percent. Um, and you know it's that collaboration that we have, like you, a billion dollars in sales saying, here's what's in my book. Here's how I do pricing that doesn't exist elsewhere. So um, I know we are like pushing towards the end yet. We have hands up. Jeanette, are you okay that we have questions? I love it. Thank you. Mark, let's start with you. I think Kim's hand was waving too. Maybe my uh, internet is working a little bit better now. And and, 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 I'm sorry, Jeanette, you may have already answered part of this question, but um, you have a listing on Toro Canyon Road, and you talked about the market being different two years ago. What have you done in, in either through shift or pivot to change anything that you've done on the marketing of that property? Well, and that one's under contract now. Thank you, Jesus. But um, we we did it was a new construction. So when it started, the market was hot. And when it's finishing, the market is not. (laughs) So that builder has a performer that doesn't look as attractive as it did when it when it first started. Um, The I really didn't do anything different. We just did more of the same. And and that is more of the phone call. We have so much inventory at our higher end. You know, but before you had a high end buyer, you know, there was like 15 things to look at. Somebody was going to find you regardless, even if you were a lazy agent, you know, this is what I mean. Like a couple of years ago, it was super easy, but now we might have 50 properties that, that could fit that criteria. So we're just chief reminder officers. We're calling those agents, working with buyers. We collaborate within each, you know, within our group. Um, Again, that's what I love about KW. Somebody else has a $5 million listing and they had agent so-and-so come through with a buyer and it didn't, wasn't the right fit. They're going to call me and say, Hey, you might want to, what might want to call, um, you know, that Mar- Mary Ellen Elwell was the last, an agent called me and said, Hey, Mary Ellen Elwell came through with a buyer. You might want to call her for your listing on wild basin. So it's that kind of collaboration and just picking up the phone. You got to stay, you're in it. You mm-hmm. got, you got to be, you know, neck deep within the market um, to, to, to know where the buyers are and what you need to pivot to do differently. My go-to always is just pick up the phone, talk to other agents, see what coming soons are coming on the market. If we have to adjust our price, I would rather do it before that coming soon came on. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to know that unless I'm asking. Yeah. Which I feel like that phone call, Jeanette, serves so many purposes. I mean, it's connection. It's a, it's a network within it's selling the next property. It's knowing what's coming soon. It's talking about pricing. It's giving ammo for your pricing conversations. Like what a powerful, um, oftentimes we think like, no, I, you know, these are, I don't want competition. I don't want these competitors. Um, that's not the spirit of it. I I love that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maria, how about you? Yes. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you for for all the information you are providing. It's amazing. Okay. You said at the beginning, uh, you said at the beginning that uh, to invest into marketing. You also say social media doesn't work that much. You mentioned mailer. You're huge on that. Uh, but I want to ask you, as far as because you mentioned a lot of open houses, so you can get to know people and, and the people that is there. 
what do you do in those open houses? We're talking about the luxury level. What is different than, you know, lower market? What do you provide? Yeah, yeah sure. So so we'll do, first we engage the, the neighbors. I mean, I, I might put together like more of a invitation, like a wedding invitation kind of a looking thing, like something thick paper, all those little bitty things do elevate you and make you stand out. So uh, instead of door knocking, you know, around, I'm going to mail an invitation to the people on that street. You know, do you, do you know anyone you'd like enough that you want them as your neighbor? <laughs> the, the house is going to be open. Please come. So when we do initial open houses at those properties, they tend to not be as much public like Sunday, it depends on the price point. Um, sometimes they are, but we'll have, you know, a little bit to eat and drink, not, not, ex, you know, don't go breaking the bank, just a little bit of something, but it can, can be even as simple as look at your yard signs. I mean, sometimes I go up to a house and a sign's dirty or rusted or dented, or it's all a reflection of you and how you present a property. When they walk in, we always have the right materials. We don't go active until our materials are back and they're complete. We have a, a comprehensive package for people and I'll put it all into, you know, this kind of like plastic envelopes. You get it. Um, they sometimes come in different colors. You get an office depot, office max, and they're like, like an envelope and they, but they're plastic and I'll put all the documents in there. I might have 15 of them so that I can hand those to people. Um, there's always handwritten notes in those documents. Thank you for coming by. Please, please reach out if you have any questions about this property or, or, or anything related to real estate. Um, many times, even in the, in the lower price point market, we'll have almost like a, a financial picture if that was an investment property because we have a lot of wealthy Austinites who pick up properties as investments. So we'll already run numbers for people um, for them to know what something could rent out for or if it could qualify as an Airbnb, you know, how that works. So anything kind of a, a little bit notch above, I mentioned the towels, but we'll do, we'll do um, themed that I've had ice cream trucks come. You know, if you have a neighborhood with like, you know, there's a lot of kids in that neighborhood, you stick a sign out the entrance of the neighborhood, ice cream truck on Sunday from two to four. I mean, you're going to have a load of people. Um, so those kind of things are going to be expensive, but at the beginning, roll towels. And I don't think, I don't know if it ever gets cold enough there that you need anything more than than cold towels but whatever might work you know get little bites from a, a neighborhood bakery and put their sign up they'll likely sell them to you for a discounted rate if you're going to be advertising and you're building a relationship there as well I love it I love it and Kim did you were you waving earlier Yes, just a, a kind of a last quick question. Um, Jeanette, thank you so much. You've been so generous of your time and information. Um, at, you probably don't have time to, to share right now, but a couple of things you said that would love some elaboration on, which was, you know, when you're calling all these agents, you said you have a series of questions that you ask. I'd love to get our hands on those questions. And then sure. um, I'm a numbers girl. And so when you talk about this spreadsheet that you roll out across the table, like I'm obsessed with that idea. So I always do a quick CMA, but I don't have seven extra columns. So what are those seven columns that you have? Well, we would well, love in it. our MLS, it does not show us the, when we do um, like a quick CMA, um, it doesn't show the original list price. It shows the last list price. So I want the original list price. And then I'm the next column is going to be the percentage reduction to the current price. Another column is going to be the number of reductions, which is like more important now. I, a couple of years ago, we didn't have time for that, right? That everything sold. But now I want to show this property had three reductions. So the that that percentage reduction from original to the price that it had to be in order to get someone interested in it. 
that might have taken three steps, right? That's good data. And then the, the remaining columns are what was the, the sold price? So you got three different prices, original, the last one where someone got it interested, and then the sold one. And then you have different percentages because at the sold, I'm going to have the total percentage from the original list price and the percentage reduction from the last list price. And then I have the columns for the, the commentary from the buyer's agent and the listing agent. And within that, you asked about questions. It's it's real simple. The questions I'm asking the agent are mainly about mechanicals. Like, did it have a new roof? Did it have new ACs? I, on a big house, a new roof and a couple ACs is $200,000. You know, that's real money. So I'm asking about, was the pool resurfaced? When did they do the, the remodel? Oh, the house is remodeled. Did they do the remodel? No, it was seven years ago. Okay, that's not as Im impactful to me because... If, I if a buyer has to change out countertops, it's just as expensive if the house was remodeled two years ago or 10 years ago. The new countertop costs the same, mm -hmm. right? So I, I'm making those type of calculations and questions when I'm talking to the agent. And other times you'll find out it was their brother, so they, they didn't charge anything for the sale. Um, our MLS has a space for repairs but it's not a required field. So a lot of times you'll see repairs a dollar. You know, they just stuck something in. And I really want to know, like, was it deferred maintenance? Did, you know, was it $40,000 in repairs? Was it $40 in repair? Like, what was it? Because all of that will change values. If something is significant, if there's something significant that stands out, I will add another column to say, no, no listing fee was charged, you know, rel a relative, it's a friends and family deal or, or whatever. There was $200,000 in repairs. I'm going to pull all that information out. Um, the other thing, you know, I, I'm pretty good, you know, since I focus on a little, uh, kind of a little microcosm of, of our city, I'm, I can usually get to all the houses you know, or if I'm here, I've got boots on the ground, they might FaceTime me through. I work really hard to stay on top of the inventory mm -hmm. um, because you probably know this in your market too. Many times they don't photograph the bad things like the telephone, you know, poles behind or, you know, you, you can't see from the MLS, you can't hear from the MLS road noise. So all of that's going to go in the comment section. There was no privacy. There was privacy. There was no view. There was a view. What kind of view was it? I might even add things like, you know, it's across the street from the elementary school or it's next to the park. It's adjacent to green space. So you get to enjoy it, but you're not paying for it. All those things become value adjustments. And those are the kind of questions that I'll ask. I love that. Um, I have one last question before we wrap up. Your banding of prices, Jeanette, how do you identify the band? I'm I'm a lot like Kim, the numbers speak to me. Do you do it as like a percentage or is it just the like heavy population, the like median sales prices? How do you do that? Well, I first start with the, the bands are in even increments. So I might do a hundred thousand dollar band or 500,000 brackets. And I might do it multiple times before something like comes, like before it's meaningful. I may start at, you know, 500,000 and then I might reduce the bands to 250,000. But any, there's nothing, there's no right or wrong with each property. You'll have to discern what the proper bracket is. Um, and so I just do that all the way through. And if there's a lot of information, there's a lot of transactions, I'll kind of put in the in the side margin, um, you know, two, two actives and eight. So, you know, two A, eight S in each bracket so that I'm not sitting there with them counting. I mean, they can see it's more solds than it. But what but what I'm showing them is, is there's four times the sales as the number of interested you know, as the number of actives. Mm -hmm. And what I'm also trying to show is which 
is what I just call it a flow, like what, which section has just a natural flow. And I say to my sellers, you know, we could talk all day long about why your house is better than someone else's. And that someone else will talk all day long about why their house is better than yours. So this isn't a debate on that. This is just the buyers, regardless of what your bedroom looks like or how awesome your wallpaper is or you know, what you planted outside. This is where the buyers are comfortable because the, the I think this is important, that price band, I'm not pulling out just only comparable houses. I'm saying in this million to million five bracket, in this vast area, so it's not just the neighbor, this vast area, that's that's all the data. Those are all the houses in that price band. So they may be way smaller, or way larger, or older or newer. That's not the debate that the apples to apples, house to house. It's just in this area of town, if somebody's coming in with wanting to spend or look at a million to a million five, what what typically happens at the end? Where are they most comfortable? Mm. And when you can show it's a million three fifty, then sellers are more com confident. They're willing to to list at your suggestion. I love it, Jeanette. You are a um, example of words matter. You know, when you were just talking about that pricing conversation, you were very factual, matter of fact. And then when you flip to the buyer side, it's that they're comfortable and you use that terminology to move and weave the sellers uh, to where you need them to be. Um, I think we can listen to you all day and we are already way past time. Jeanette, where can people find you, connect with you? I know you offer courses. Um, what's the best way that we can reach out to you? And send I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to put it in here, my phone number. And always, um, I'm I'm really, you know, serious. If you are, you know, stuck or you're working on a listing or you have, you know, a client and you just, you know, things just aren't going well, just give me a call. And here, I just put my email and my um, phone number in there. Just give me a call and we can chat about it. If I'm tied up then, we'll, we'll set a time, but feel free to reach out. It's always fun to hear about other markets and it's always great to help people. So I definitely want to be a resource for you if you need anything. Well, Jeanette, we appreciate it. So referrals for Austin only or Austin and Nantucket? No, I do not sell homes in Nantucket. Okay. That is it. not why I'm here. <laughs> I'm no, here to fine. relax. <laughs> <laughs> I love but it. Austin, yeah, d definitely Austin. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you so much. This, um, I mean, we had 30 people on here at a, at a certain point. Um, all of our agents in our market center will have this posted with your contact information for referrals within our closed Facebook pages. So we appreciate you so much. I took pages of notes. Um, oh, and we are very grateful. We and I'm rewriting that luxury class right now. So when it when I get it finished, I'll um I'll send it to you, Amber, and you can share it. That would be but in that class, it's five modules and like we have a whole hour just on pricing as oh. an example. There's a whole hour on like where to get information um to kind of educate yourself and elevate your yourself and your kind of talk and uh, where those sources are. There's a whole section just for sellers, a whole section just for buyers. And then I think the last section is the client experience. So mm -hmm. it, it's a, it, there's more, you know, like tactical things that you can walk away and do immediately. Awesome, Jeanette. Well, we appreciate you so much. Um, it's very grateful. And we look forward to sending you some referrals and let me know when the class sure. is ready. And we will have you back on to share more about it. All right. Bye. See you Bye, later. Bye, guys. Thank you, Jeanette. You're welcome. Good to see you, Mark.